Good evening. Welcome to the Township Board of Trustees meeting for Thursday, October 10th. Ms. Lane, would you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> I would like to entertain a motion to approve the agenda as printed. Second. Okay, for both the consent agenda and the regular agenda. It's been seconded by Mr. Massey. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, yeah, Mr. Buzak. Just have a question. Uh, I don't think this is the updated agenda because remember we changed the amount from 352 on the Green Valley assessment. And it should be a, the amount that we quoted before, which is uh, well, it's changed up. 326, 526, 568, 79. Okay. Okay, I'd just like to add that. So. All right, so. I can correct those. Yeah, we can correct that. Right. Okay. All right, so motion that was passed through uh, for both the consent agenda and the regular agenda. Um, just one other thing on the agenda. I don't see uh, the Hoffmans here for the special presentation, so I, we'll hold off on that uh, probably till our next meeting unless they, they show up. But uh, with that, uh, we'll move right to uh, public comment. So um, we'll open the floor for anybody who wants to speak. We ask to keep it three minutes, give us your name and address, and uh, looks like you're ready to come up, so come on up. <laughs> we won't hold you back. Good evening. Good evening. My name is John Ziska, 5494 Park Grove Court. I'm building a house. I'm just kind of recapping what I said sure. the other yeah, day. Yeah, that's fine. On McCandlish Road, probably yes. a month away. And what I'm asking for is to have a freestanding well, only for irrigation only, because I've already tapped into the water and sewer already. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, I'm about 30 days away from moving in. It's kind of holding up my landscaping for this. So that's what I just want to see what we can do, okay. what needs to be done to get right. this. Mr. Okay. Lehman, it would be acceptable to, to uh, I guess, refer this to you and Mr. Sears and our DPW committee to study it and see where we're at in the next week here? Or? Um, yeah, it, it sounds like time is of the essence, and I'd be happy to... Um, sit down and I know that you have talked with DPW, I know you had some attorney attorney contact. Uh, we just have to look at the ordinance, make sure that um, what you're referring to do is, is uh, allowed and we're also right in the middle of that rate study so I think we can probably get between Raf Tallis, uh, Mark Consult, and DPW director, myself, uh, get you an answer back within uh, seven days. Excellent. If you, uh, and Jeff, you have his contact information, correct? Sure. So Wait. we can reach out to you. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Chief, mm -hmm. I did ask him to uh, get the board some information regarding to how many wells are currently in that area. And I think that information would be helpful. I'll, I'll try to find that out tomorrow, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, you, you were also going to include the DPW. So yeah. May with that meeting then. Right. Yep. Okay. Okay, so we'll take a look at it and be in contact in the next few days. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jim Rabine, 9608 Pine Valley Dive in Grand Blanc, the president of the Grand Blanc Community Association. I've passed out a revised update to the memoir I left you at the cow. I've done some advanced work and been able to identify possible costs to the township. So. I refer that to you for your information. Uh, rather than tying up time now, I would request your permission to be able to answer questions and discuss our proposal in more detail when you get to the uh, future positioning item. Yeah, I, we intend, I intend to have a discussion on it, so. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you for the additional information. Okay, moving back towards the back of the room. Uh, anybody else care to speak? Yeah, 7212 Porter Road. You know, at uh, Tuesday's meeting, I heard the thing come up about roads again. 
road paving. It's really mo road maintenance. We need to maintain the roads we have. We're not talking about building roads. We're talking about maintaining them. I'm surprised the uh, road commission, since they're in charge of roads, they don't have a policy or a ordinance that says a road needs to be repaired and that's it. Don't have a choice. Or the township have a policy on once a road is so bad and you start bending your wheels and getting tires blown out, I mean, it's time to say that road's going to be repaired and issue and get a, um, what do you want to call it, a... Um, Pazer rating. Pardon? Pazer rating. <clears throat> yeah. We, we, we've got to have a policy that says that road is going to be done, you know. <clears throat> so, I'm surprised the road commission doesn't. They're responsible for the roads. It should just... Once the road's falling apart, it should be fixed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. So when I, I wrote, you're suggesting that when a road falls below a certain pager level that it automatically have a special assessment. Correct. I think it has to be done. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Let me go back to that. I brought this up. My first home I bought, I just bought it, it was tight, I was very young. Had it built, it was on a gravel road. I was there about a year and they came in and they were going to pave it. Oh my gosh, I can't afford to do that. But 10 years later, I sold the home for double because they put the road in. Mm. Increases the value of the home. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay, um, anybody in the back room care to speak? Okay. If there's nobody else who wish to make public comment, we'll close the public comment and uh, move it back up to the uh, board here. Okay. I'm sorry? Okay. Um, at this time, uh, I'll take a, mo a motion to uh, approve the minutes, either individually or as a whole, whichever you choose. I still move. Support. <coughs> as, a as a whole? Entire. As a whole. Okay. Supported. Support. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any of those opposed? With that, uh, we're going to skip this special presentation. Uh, this consent agenda items have already been approved. And now we'll move to uh, regarding the Grand Reserve Community Association asking for a change in our ordinance <coughs> regarding disconnection from the municipal water systems for irrigation purposes. Um, would you like to speak again with regard to the information you're presenting tonight? Yes, dear. I, I, there's been a lot of discussion. I know meeting after meeting as, as I've tried to seek out the facts and, and get clarity, something new seems to always come up. So my page and a half memo that you received with your packet was probably, I forget how many pages, six, seven pages long at least trying to respond to the various technical questions and issues that came up. Basically what we have is a fairly brand new community, 432 homes, a large clubhouse with an indoor and outdoor swimming pool, a, a beautiful asset to the community. People love living there, mostly because of the other people that are there. We enjoy your community, we enjoy your police and fire protections, they're absolutely superior. We do like being here. Our problem being is that poultry's now gone. They walked out the door, uh, leaving some things behind that they're working on to finish their transition, but they've uh, they basically turned over the control of the Master Association to the residents. We're trying to do what we can to try to control the cost. Our current monthly assessments are $375, plus the local the neighborhood condominium associations have some additional expenses they add on. So we're basically talking something that's in the ballpark of $400 a month is what they pay altogether. All the improvements, the uh, maintenance of the storm system, plowing of the roads, irrigation, cutting of lawns, that type of thing are all done under the control and the ownership of the Master Association. So almost all the money goes there. Right now the, our irrigation cost is almost 10% of our total annual operating budget. In the last several years our costs with the weather and with some of the cost saving things we've tried to do have fluctuated between about two hundred and seventy five to three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars just for water, not counting readiness to serve or any other cost. We look at that and we see the cost of bringing water all the way from the Great Lakes to the treatment plant down to here. 
for our water is, is uh, an unnecessary expense if we could cut back on that. What we would like to do is to service parts of our community that we can do it on an economical basis by using our current pond system. To the extent that stormwater is not sufficient, we would augment those ponds by pumping well water into them to keep the water level up. And then we then use that to irrigate areas of the community. Those areas would no longer need your meters that we have in underground vaults. We'd come in there, have those terminated, cut off from your public system at the, at the water main. We would uh, decommission our rest of our meter pit and we would connect things to the public, to our private water system coming from the ponds. Take a look at doing that approximately, uh, I, I did some hasty preliminary engineering and I took a look at what area we could serve and it looks like it might affect six of your 21 meter pits. Plus the areas that Pulte has already converted the system affects three more which are still technically in service. If we separate all nine of those meter pits and it was cost effective to service the whole area that I showed in that map I left the other night with the pink squiggles on, we reduce our, our water bill by about 35 percent. Last year's number were, were, was a fairly high number as far as irrigation went and a lot of the cost saving measures are already in place so it was a good benchmark year to kind of give you an extreme exposure for the community. The cost for the six meter pits that we were looking at <clears throat> would have been about $73,000 for water. The three that were decommissioned, if they were still using water at the rate they were before we made the cost saving improvements, would have added another $60,000 to that. So the six we're looking at tonight, the potential of expanding on. We're talking about $73,000 or less in commodity charges. We're talking about $7,300 approximately in, in the register service <coughs> charge for a total loss of income to the township of $80,000 or less depending upon what's cost effective. Part of our community is not service, doesn't need to be irrigated because it's, it's ponds, it's water surface, or it slopes down near there, which is already pl plenty wet. They are wetland areas that we don't take water out of, if anything we put water into them. Or the nature trail areas that don't require any maintenance of the lawn area whatsoever. So we'd still maintain our 432 homes and our lodge connected to your public water system for drinking water purposes and for sanitary sewer services. We would still maintain, don't know the exact count, something in the range of 11 or 12 of the meters to service the upland area. A good part of the condominium association of single family sites are an area where we don't have any ponds. And the cost to get water from the ponds to service that area, a preliminary look, this looks like it's absolutely cost prohibitive. So we're not even asking about that. Our request is strictly limited to that, that limited area showing in pink and very possibly an area less than that. But the cost to do the detailed work to get engineers and consultants involved move forward and get plans and permits moving forward is <coughs> not complying with all the community standards. We don't know what those standards are going to be. So we, we request that you specifically provide relief either in your ordinance or through a variance or interpretation of the ordinance that would allow us to accomplish the task that we've set before us. The uh, water we paid last, last year, we paid for 12 months a year. Every resident paid $33.56 out of their association dues just to pay for just the water, not counting the meters, not talking about the backflow preventers that we have to maintain and have certified every year before your DPW installs the meters again. That could have been $21.93 if all six of these meters were gone. That would have saved our residents only $140 by the time you throw the meter pits in, probably at over $150 a year. But at 432 residents and, and struggling mightily to keep our fees below $400, trying to make sure people are viable and happy, want to stay living where they're living. We need to do whatever we can to control our costs. So it's a fairly broad subject. Unfortunately, it's changed a lot from time to time. I think I'd rather address any specific questions or clarifications you might need or that, that the uh, administration might need to move forward on this request. Let me just clarify, you said th each resident is paying $33 a month for water for irrigation? Just for the irrigation water. They're paying for their own water and sewer in their house. 
-hmm. None of the residents provide irrigation to their site. That's all under the ownership and control of the master. So we could, re yes, the cost of the water alone for last year was the $33 a month based upon the actual <coughs> consumption in last year's. Last year's the last full year's record I had available. Don't tell my wife because I think mine's $500 a month for watering your lawn. <laughs> Just watering your lawn? You got a wife like mine then. Anybody have any questions? Yes. The follow up yeah. question. You said $33.68 per month. $33.56 per month of their $400 fees goes toward water. It's going just towards the cost of the water. <coughs> That's closer to $37 per time you had to cost the meter. So it's close to 10% of the total fee. I want to have a couple of our staff come up to and um, talk as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sears. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, in your board packets, you should have received a memo from me. Um, it would have been a Tuesday night's packet outlining my concerns with uh, Grand Reserve's request. It's it, it's not about to the DPW the economics or to the township about the economics of what how much uh, each person pays in Grand Reserve for their irrigation. To me, it's simply about the dangerous precedents we set if we start allowing people to disconnect from our water system. What you have to remember is that I run an extremely efficient, well-maintained and well-built water system. And uh, even Mr. Rabine has made the comment several times that it's some of the best he's seen being a pest engineer working in this industry. And to lose, to start losing customers because let's face it, and I think Dennis and maybe even Mr. Laddie would agree, once we open up Pandora's box, we're going to have an epidemic. Uh, you know, Scott made the comment about his irrigation costs and maybe even some of the other board members here get their lawn and know how much that costs. There's, uh, you know, a lot of other residents in this community who during the summer months call us wondering why their water bill is so high. And we just simply ask them to check their irrigation controls and see how often they're watering and then a light bulb comes on. We are gonna have a lot of people wanna disconnect, and it's not just gonna stop at irrigation meters. It's, I mean, how do we stop domestic use from disconnecting? I would just caution, and I, I would ask that you think about this and do research. I'll be happy to provide whatever research you'd like. I, I would recommend that we not change the ordinance um, and we not allow people to disconnect from our water system. It was built for domestic use in this township, for the build out of the entire township. Uh, you know, we don't have capacity issues in our water system because it was built for everyone, including homes, irrigation systems, uh, businesses, industrial areas, everything. So just think about that. We, we have a system big enough to serve all of our customers right now. If customers start dropping off, we start having economical problems. No, Grand Reserve alone will not cause an issue. But whenever people start disconnecting in masses, it will cause an issue. It's going to cause uh, water quality issues, storage issues, everything else. I think Mr. Potter can attest to it also. But I'm also happy to answer any questions you might have. It, that's my opinion on it, my recommendation. Mr. Mansour? Uh, Mr. Bennett, I think you, you actually are a representative on the uh, KWA uh, yes. authority. And uh, we have a contract, if I'm not mistaken, uh, with KWA to supply uh, our township with water. Correct. Um, and I'm just uh, wondering, I'm not familiar with it, I'm sorry, but are there any um, uh, kind of minimum requirements or certain amounts of uh, water that, you know, we're kind of obligated to, uh, to use? Well, I, I don't know about minimum amount that we're obligated, but uh, one of the things that we are paying is peak demand, right? I mean. Uh, Probably Mr. Potter knows, That's correct. but, but I, I mean, our rates are based on how much we've used at a maximum, and that sure. isn't going away. And I don't believe we have a minimum amount of water we have to purchase in any given time. But I do believe that the KWA and the Genesee County Water Treatment Plant was built on our usage of their system and our historic usage and what our usage could be in the future. 
Uh, Grand Blanc is growing. Development is crazy right now. Everybody in the county knows that. We would be fools to think that they didn't account for that whenever they built all this. So a simple change in ordinance allowing people to uh, disconnect could bring some heat from Genesee County. I'm not saying that that's a, a, a terrible thing and we're all going to be in trouble for it. But I, I think that it'd be, uh, it would not be a favorable decision. I have, Do you have anything you want to add to that? I, I want Mr. Powder to come up, but I, I have heard from other residents already that have heard about this, that if this is allowed, they're going to be in here to disconnect their subdivision or development as well. I'm and sure their homes. Right. So right. I, I have heard, I think Mr. Massey, you've heard that as well, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Potter? Ms. Lane, you had a question? My question is, uh, I don't believe there's any way when we started the water system in 1980 that we planned for subdivisions to have water. I just heard recently, because I'm on a well, that we have people who are paying for a second meter in order to reduce their costs at least partially and that it's uh, there's about a three hundred and forty dollar charge to do that plus a plumbing permit so I would think Mr. Sears that if people wanted to do that I don't personally see a problem with that but I personally don't believe that any subdivision is going to drop off of uh, our municipal water system for use in their homes, especially with... Um, no, for their irrigation is what I'm speaking of. Right. Well, the, the point is, is if we start allowing irrigation to connect, disconnect, how can we stop people from disconnecting their domestic services? There are plenty of people that call in every single quarter because they don't like to pay a water bill. Well, I mean, I don't necessarily like to pay any of my bills, but it's a, you know, it's a luxury I enjoy, so I'm going to pay for it. It's, it's not, I don't believe entire subdivisions are just going to start disconnecting from our water system, but I don't believe we can stop it either once we start allowing this. Um, it, it's, it's dangerous. It really is. Well, we, we have taken people to court for basically uh, stealing our water. Absolutely. Right. Um, there's no reason to believe we wouldn't have people uh, running their own line from their well over their home next. We, we, we prosecute everybody we find stealing water. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not, it's mostly builders, I will admit. It's mostly builders building new houses. And they're not necessarily fans of mine. But maybe I have a reputation now that says you can't come to Grand Blank Township and steal water. Scott, you're right. We do not have a cross-connection inspection program for residential homes. If I allow people to drill wells in addition to their domestic service, I unless I start that program up in mass, then we could have people that could cross-connect mm -hmm. their plumbing, uh, you know, switch up, change one valve, so that they can start running well water into their house, and then every once in a while change it back over to domestic use so that they have some usage on their meter. Right now that's the only way I would catch it if their usage dropped off to zero on their meter. Mm -hmm. People are very smart, so it's, it's possible. Yeah. I can start a cross-connection program for residential homes, but it's going to cost us money. So, uh, Mr. Potter, I know you work, uh, maybe you can give a little snapshot. I don't know that everybody realizes that uh, you do work not only for us, but also for the county. For, yeah, maybe, for a number of communities besides here, but maybe you can kind of outline for the residents uh, your your involvement with the water, you know, a big picture kind of thing. Um, from a township standpoint or overall standpoint? Overall and okay. then township. From the to the question of Mr. Mansour, the township doesn't have a contract with KWA. KWA has a contract with Genesee County Water and Waste Services, and then Grand Lake Township has a contract with Water and Waste Services to provide them water. KWA is raw water from the lake. Right to the county's treatment plant and then we buy treated water for the for the township. Um, so that's the overall picture of, of how the water system works. From a to address this particular situation, in 2004 we did a master plan for the entire township for water and sewer. And at the time Pulte was build, building significantly here. Um, Woodfield was being developed. There was a lot of demand in the southern end, both domestic and for irrigation purposes. We were tasked with 
putting together a water system and a capital improvement program that would supply not only domestic water, but irrigation water, which was actually part of the driving force of the size of the mains, the size of the tanks, the size of the pumping infrastructure. And that was built to provide those irrigation demands in not only the South End, but any part of the township that was going to be developed because that was the way development was going, that everything that got built was using irrigation. So that's the way the system was designed. That's why the ordinance was changed so that it doesn't allow people to disconnect because if we allow that to happen, then the design parameters that we built this whole thing on start to fall apart. So that's the, the crux of the matter to me. There's a legal situation with the ordinance and it's enforceable the way it is. It could be tweaked maybe, but I think the entire system is built on those demands and we need to be careful if we're gonna start changing the, the demands and the way the infrastructure was designed and built. Mr. Massey? My question, since you have so much knowledge going back to 2002 and 2004. 1974 actually, it's been, okay, I'm way old. You, since you have all of this knowledge, since you have a lot of knowledge, so I have one question for you. Well, let me make a comment first. From 2004 up until the last, let me say four or five, four years, the price of water has cha changed dramatically. Do you agree or disagree? It, it has definitely changed. Well, you don't have to say definitely changed. It has changed dramatically because I'm going to tell you why. I love to pull into a subdivision that has beautiful green lawns. I am one that I promote that. But in my subdivision, I cannot irrigate my lawn system because I cannot afford $1,500 per quarter. I cannot afford that. Okay? So that's the dramatic change that has shifted. When I first moved into my house up until about four years ago, I had a beautiful green lawn. I could irrigate my system. System, my bill for three months was around $400. Okay? Uh, at one time when it got, we had a drought spell there, it was approximately $500. So now, last year, that my lawn burned up, okay? Year prior to that, same thing happened. This year, we were blessed because we received a lot of rain from heaven. But when you're talking about beautiful lawns, that's a problem throughout the township. It's not only a problem in Dale Well, it's a problem throughout the township. So if we have to address that problem throughout the township, just keep in mind, one of the biggest complaints that the residents have is their water bill. Well, you don't have to agree with me, but I know that for a fact. The, and, and, and it's not a matter of agreeing or disagreeing, but I think if you look at the utilities that you pay for, water, sewer, telephone, cable, TV, gas, and electric, you'll find that water is the, the best value that you get. If you look at all of the cost of all of those, I'll bet you the best value you get for your dollar is the cost of water. Well, you don't have to convince me. You have to con I have to convince the residents. Well, yeah, well, go look at the cost of go, go look at the cost of buying water in a store for a a bot what's a buck for a, a little bottle of water. That bottle of water out of your tap is about five cents. But people go buy water. I mean, it, it, so the cost of water is 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 a great deal. Yeah. While people complain about the cost, it's all relative to what you look at the yeah. rest of your utilities cost is. Relative to this issue, the uh, uh, one thing that, that uh, people might be amazed to find is that uh, you know we think that water is expensive in Genesee County. Um, but everybody, wherever they live, it's just like uh, people think that they've got the best football team in their, their community, right? <clears throat> Everybody thinks the road they live on is the worst in, in their community, you know. Um, if you go around the country, though, they'll, they'll, every community you go to, they think they're paying too much for water. Mm -hmm. We think it's just us in Genesee County or us in Michigan that, you know, we're surrounded by Great Lakes and everybody thinks, oh my God, our water rates in Michigan are through the roof. Um, they're a lot worse in other parts of the country and just as worse in most of it. Um, so it isn't, from what I've researched anyway, that Michigan is not unique in having that. Actually, other utilities such as electricity, we're paying much higher rates than, than their surrounding states. I don't know how we compare on water, but 
electricity, I am aware of that. Um, but uh, if, if we start allowing people to, because we aren't going to be able to do a one-off where we say, hey, guess what, this development can can get off well and go on wells, right? I mean, we're gonna, it's going to have to allow everybody, right? I mean, we can't just let one, one yeah, group. Whatever, right? whatever policy you set, that needs to be your policy. Is that true, Mr. D Laddie? No, you're right. We're, each property is a little bit different, right? Developments mm -hmm. are different from from region to region, but that is basically true. We're gonna have you, you need to you need to write your ordinance, you need to and enforce your ordinance in a way that is as uniform as possible. Mm -hmm. And particularly, we have we have drawn a line uh, in our ordinance between multiple users, commercial users, residential users. Mm -hmm. We haven't made a distinction between irrigation <clears throat> necessarily right. and, and drinking water. But uh, you're exactly right, and we've and, and just to to piggyback on a comment that uh, <coughs> Mr. Potter made, there are as our water ordinance has evolved, and this is actually the case uh, in, in the county as well. You'll see a lot of varying terms in the ordinance. You'll you'll see uh, property described as a premises. You'll see it described including in per, a pertinent land. You'll see it described as parcels, as buildings, as structures, as habitable structures and things like that. And, and basically, f throughout the history of our ordinance, while those terms are essentially interchangeable, they mean, they mean the same thing, and that is that the, the public policy in the state of Michigan, and also as adopted by Grand Lake Township, is to replace individual wells with a municipal water source. And I, I'm just struck tonight by how well our how good our water source is by all accounts right and we know what happens when a water source goes bad we know what happens when it goes stale when it becomes abandoned and underused and, and we don't have that situation in Grand Lake Township and just uh, and I'll just dovetail this into into a legal comment about our ordinance the way our current ordinances are currently written and enforced once you're connected to our system you cannot disconnect for all the public policy reasons that Jeff Sears and, and Dan Potter have just described it is detrimental to the system to build a system to a certain size and then allow that system to shrink from users and non-use. It is, it is a public policy disaster to allow that to happen. And so what, what you need to do is you need to analyze all these, these questions individually and, and consider the request uh, uh, like the folks at Grand Reserve have put forward, which by, which by the way is about one of the best and most comprehensive requests I've ever seen. <laughs> Uh, from a group of folks that that want to have a discussion on policy, but you really have to err on the side of of protecting your system, and um, and from a legal standpoint, that is the basis of your ordinances, mm -hmm. and that is the basis of your policy. So, so given that uh, you know we we can't, I mean, our board likes to 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 make our residents happy, right? Um, we we all ran for our position here to try and make Grand Blank Township uh, continue to be a great place to live and try and make all of our residents happy when we can, but um, obviously we can't pass ordinances they are only good for certain people and bad for other people, but with regard to this, this issue with water, um, if, if, if for whatever reason we said, hey, we, we want to, uh, to go with this, would, would the rest of us see an increase in our water rates? We would have to reposition the, the rates to cover the cost of the system, and if you lost whatever the MCF is that uh, Grand Reserve uses, or anybody else that decided to disconnect, then we would have to change the rates to cover the cost of the system, because that's what we do with a, with a setting the rates, is we cover the cost of the system. So we're undergoing a rate study, or going to be starting one here real quick, right? We have started, yes. So have you, has anybody talked with, uh, what's the name of the firm that we have? Ref Talis. And they're, I understand, one of the leading firms in the state. In the country. In the country. Have anybody mentioned this issue to them? Not, I haven't, I think Dennis did briefly, maybe. So the only thing I would say is that from their standpoint, um, of course we're in the middle of the study, we can wait until we get the results back, but I would be, uh, it, it, they look at it from public policy decision as well, and you're not going to get a lot of advice from somebody who's going to tell you that, yeah, you should. this is a good idea to change your ordinance and allow disconnects once you side the system. I look at the most relevant information that you've heard today is that, I, while I understand you know, that the cost of irrigation is tough, and, it, and these guys really have done their homework. They've looked at every option to reduce the use wherever they can, and they come down to this final request. But you heard Mr. Potter tell you that 
He asked the board back at that time, like, how do you want us to, to size the system? We have to master plan our infrastructure. What do you the, want us the to do? The board for the web? No, the, the, the okay. township uh, board of trustees. And they said, no, no, we want to make sure that we have the capacity for build out, including irrigation. And so we sized that system to do that. We created that plan that said, this is what we're going to do. That gave us a distinct advantage. There's a reason why Palti could come in and build 432 homes in Grand Reserve because we sized the system to do so. Um, it's a reason why we have Technology Village being looked at. It's a reason why we have the DDA created where we can look at creating expansion for commercial enterprises because with the foresight that the board had back then and the consultants working you know, with our DPW to size the system, that's a very key ingredient and that is the danger of, being, of changing your uh, ordinance at this point to allow disconnect because those rates will go somewhere else, so they'll be passed on to the other people because we the system is the system. We still have to maintain that system. Um, so that is a danger. There will be some impact. Uh, and I, I just I don't see why you would make that plan and, and, and try to reverse it at this point. I empathize with them with the, with the thing of water. I think they really looked at it. It's five hundred nine dollars a year. I think was one of his notes. Um, I just, you know, I, I don't think that you're going to find Raf Talis, our consultants, DPW director, uh, or attorney Laddie or myself um, ever provide the the uh, recommendation that you would allow the disconnect from water once someone's disconnected. Okay. Was Mr. Atkins, then Mr. Massey. I was just curious, Mr. Potter, have you seen other communities in Genesee County disconnecting from the water source? Other communities or yeah. other? You mean individuals in the communities? In the communities. Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay, because you mentioned that the water rates would go up. The water rates have gone up every year. They're going to go up every single year. So I, I don't think that you're 100%. Uh, I think they're not that's going an up assumption. They're, they're, not, they're not going up this year. Yeah. I don't think they went up. Okay, well, they've gone up every year I've been here. So they didn't go up last year. year. Uh, ready to serve charges. Water is outrageous no matter how you look at it. Water is a very When I had a house year. built in this community, the builder asked me if I really wanted the irrigation system put in or not because he thought I was wasting my money because nobody in my subdivision can afford to water their lawn. So I, I, I do think that there is something to be said about an irrigation solution you know we are a community that have a lot of rural developments it's too bad that we um you know past boards put that in policy that it would cover all the irrigation because we're not a city we have a lot of rural areas with people that have a lot of acres of land i couldn't imagine how they would be able to afford to irrigate that land or grow um, vegetables on it or plants or anything. It only includes areas where water is available. It doesn't include rural areas that don't have water available. And the water rates haven't gone up every year? No. In fact, uh, I think you'll see that uh, in Genesee County, um, the projection is that, uh, and as mentioned before, it isn't, it isn't just us that our water rates water. have been increasing. It's, it's everybody around us in the state. Water rates in the township didn't go up last year or this year. The county didn't raise rates last year or this year. And they don't intend to raise rates next year. And I mean, if you look at if you look at a graph showing the water rates, you're going to see you're going to see uh, other communities around us are going to continue to rise, whereas ours will level off. And uh, we're going to be in much better shape water-wise than than other communities. But that's that's going in a different direction. The only point I was making is that if we allow individuals, businesses, whoever to um, get off municipal water, the rest of us are going to end up picking up the, the freight for that. And KWA this year actually lowered the cost, the cost of operating and the cost of water from KWA to the county actually went down this year. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a plus. Mr. Chair, Mr. Massey? Let me say something. Mr. Potter, I have nothing against you. Is this in regards to water or is this in regards to Dow Well? Let, let's save that for another time. Let's let's focus on this situation that we have right here because we can get an argument whether we well, think water rates are too high. Here's what he just said, and I want some clarification on it. He said the water rates did not go up this year. The water Correct. rates went up for the residents mm -hmm. this year. That's the point I'm trying to make. They didn't go up. Well, yes, they did. It uh, went Mr. up. Pot, you I can show you my bill last year for the same amount of uh, per cubic feet that I use that is higher this year than it was last it year. Is more That's a fact. Mr. Lemina, because of the peak flow 
uh, for oh, the county change. and our charges oh. went up the 200,000 like, township that had to pay $200,000 yep. more per year to the county based upon our peak water usage so that $200,000 has to be passed along to residents we could pass it along in RTS or we could pass it along in water rates Thanks. based upon where we were with RTS charges comparable to other communities we thought it made more sense in the township uh, commodity charge to raise versus RTS. We could have done it either way. You, you, you've got three ways to raise funds. You have to raise funds that pay for your system. The capital fees are really designed to buy into the system that is already built in. Mm -hmm. They're ready to serve and the commodity rates are there to pay for the water and the maintenance and operation maintenance and ongoing uh, concerns with water. So we got a $200,000 increase. We couldn't afford to just eat the $200,000. It had to be passed on to residents in, in one So that's for the ready to serve charge. Yeah. And, the, and, right. the, and the distinction, that's why it gets a little <laughs> crazy with, with rates. The distinction there is the, way, the reason that the cost went up was because the peak month that the township had went up, not because of any rate changes. There's a rate that's in, there's an existing rate that's in place that if your peak month goes above X, then you have to pay this for the new peak charge. So the actual rates didn't go up. The cost of water went up because we had a higher peak month than we ordinarily would have. The same thing so happens with your own electricity bill at your home. Yeah. So I mean, it, it, yeah. So if you go above a certain usage level, your rate doubles. So you can make you can make the argument both ways. Cost did go up, but rates have not changed. But. So we, to get back to this particular request, um, we can't just do one off that. Uh, Dell Webb's going to be able to, to go on a well. Mr. Laddie spoke to that. It would have to be township wide. Bottom line is that probably everybody's rates would increase due to less usage, what have you, uh, maintenance of the system. The, co yeah, the cost of water would increase slightly. Mm -hmm. So regardless big, of how you feel about the cost of water, whether you think we're getting ripped off on water as a township or individuals, um, we've got to look at what our public policy is here. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, everybody ar around the country thinks they're getting ripped off on water. You know, um, everybody thinks get they're getting ripped off on, ripped cable, off on cable TV. I mean, uh, everybody's <laughs> cable bill goes up probably faster than their, their water bill. But uh, um, everybody thinks they're getting ripped off on all their utilities because they see the costs escalating and there's no alternative. It's like... You know, you, you can't shop around for uh, electricity, you can't shop around for Comcast, but the one thing that we know is that we manage our water system uh, phenomenally and that our costs are contained. Um, and I mean, we'll be looking over those finances and we're having a rate study done to see if our rates are in line with, with our, what we're getting charged and what we're charging individuals. Um, I'm not sure, you know, Ms. Lane? I don't know, Mr. Supervisor, if this question goes to Mr. Potter or to Mr. Sears. Del Webb is one of the larger, as is Woodfield, that would have uh, wells serving there for irrigation. How many large developments do we have that have wells or use wells or are on meter pits to do their irrigation for things like Del Webb or, or Woodfield. I don't even know if Woodfield does. Well, the ordinance would, before I even answer, that this ordinance wouldn't be just for them. I mean, you'd, you'd I have to be for everybody. I understand, but I would like to know how many developments are around that are large acreage parcels that you know of that would be affected as far as a development. I'm not talking about individual homes or anything else. Sure. Dell Webb um, and Woodfield are probably the two biggest irrigation customers as far as meter pits. Most of the, because in, in Woodfield there's a lot of smaller condo associations and a lot of them are on meter pits for irrigation. Meaning they all irrigate common, all, their lawn, everything mm -hmm. from meter pits. There's also um, communities like Pepperwood who's on, uh, all their irrigation is on meters. Uh, their own meters that are uh, serviced by their homeowner associations. And uh, I know there's there's a lot of other smaller condo associations. As far as acreage, there's no other, uh, you know, y you would get into um, Gemstone Valley and stuff like that. They service all there by, by home. 
the homes are connected to irrigation themselves. Uh, but as far as common irrigation, it's going to be all the smaller uh, condo associations, Del Webb, Woodfield, so on and so forth. And even some of Woodfield, the uh, single family homes are serviced by their own irrigation meters. It's not meter pits like this. Mr. Mansour? So if I heard this conversation right, our water rates, however you want to say it, went up because we had a, a peak a rise in our peak. Correct. Now, one could make the argument that if we had more of our irrigation on wells, then we wouldn't have gotten charged that extra peak, and right. we wouldn't have. I, it, so I'm just, I'm just. Sure. That's it what I just heard, rates. unless I heard some different. No, so, it, it, that that rate does fluctuate, and a lot of it is probably based on irrigation. And it hits true. in the middle of the summer because that's just we're taking showers, we're watering the Absolutely. lawns, it all all that happens. Absolutely. So I guess it, we just I think I had a ought to model that. A little bit and see because I'm I can see where if the peak goes down we get a general benefit but I'm very concerned about a broader amount of people leaving the system right. in which case you know the the offs they more than offset which was my concern and, and the reason a little bit of background the reason that we put this ordinance language into place was because of a car wash on the corner of Fenton and Grand Blank Road, Chappie's Auto Wash, that disconnected. At the time, we couldn't do anything about that uh, because our, our language allowed it. But that was the uh, the change in policy, the tipping point for us. Uh, just to finish it out, we, we've seen it in Genesee County before. Uh, to the north of us, when people leave in masses, water rates go up for everybody that's still left there. The, the minority has to pay for the, the, the system as a whole. Uh, you know, they have water rates double and triple ours. And it's simply because their water system is way too big for the amount of people that are there. And they're, they're stuck with it because it would be billions of dollars to replace it, to downsize it. But that, it, that's my biggest concern. Mr. Atkins? Um, just adding to something that uh, Trustee Mansour brought up that we heard earlier. So I do think it's important to keep to, I, I don't know if that's a separate study or what, but there is something to be said. You know, the good news is we are growing and expanding, but what does that do to peak usage? You know, I mean, are sure. we going to get to a point where, um, you know, DDA Tech Village, all this peak usage, you know, raises rates again, and then eventually nobody can irrigate their 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 lawn. So, uh, it see, it sounds like a little bit of a double-edged sword right now that I'm not a hundred percent sure we have a handle on or how to balance that out without just passing increasing rates on. Right. I think Mr. Lehman has a comment on it. In, in it's a great point, but at the same time, the easiest way to, or the most effective way to bring rates down overall is to add more people to your water system because you've got those fixed costs of water. We've already built the infrastructure. We have the capacity here. The more people we add on, the lower the rates become because we're sharing it across. So there is, as we put on even you know larger industrial customers and, and we build those areas out, we're putting more people into a system. Our capacity is there. They're going to buy in with capital. Uh, which helps us for any improvements that we need to make, but then it's just getting them on the system and, and we can show that it, it, it's like looking at some of the subdivisions that aren't serviced by water now. If they, if you put water in there, um, you're spreading those fixed costs over a greater number of, of people without really having to change the system as it exists now other than to put the mains into the new places. And we're, we're in the second highest peaking category as it is right now. We can go up one more level and then we're, we're topped out. And the peak is that not that we're increasing water usage, it's that it, it spikes, right? It's the spike in water usage, correct. Yeah. So, I mean, as usually we more people, the month of July has been our peaking month. As we add more customers, our, our price comes down because we're able to provide... We're going to spread those rates out right. amongst everybody. It, it's just when it spikes that, that, the rate, that we have to pay that fee. Correct. Mr. Massey? No question. Yes, sir. Governor Casillas. Which year was the, was the ordinance change? 2016. Well, it was discussed at length in 2015 and enacted in 2016. Okay. I want to make specifically clear to everyone that's listening, that was before this board was put in place. Okay? Yes, absolutely. You agree? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. 
So this board was not in place and did not have a say. That is true. Okay. It's still an ordinance, but you're right. This board was not here. Scott and Earl were the only ones on this board. We were the only ones on that board at the time. Yeah. Mr. Chair, it actually goes back to, um, I mean, this, this theory runs throughout our ordinances since nearly the creation of, of our, first or, our first water usage ordinance. Um, it, I mean, 2000, 2005, I'm looking at a version, 2011 we had amendments. This, it's true that, that the language, additional language was added just a couple years ago. But, but it's still, it, the, the overall theme of our ordinance is that at, when we determine what public policy we're trying to promote or, or what is the public safety we're trying to protect, we have always maintained exclusive control over who connects and who disconnects from the beginning of that ordinance, right? And so you, and you see it written in different ways and you see it throughout like 2011 2008, 2015, you see that being reinforced as we go through. But that, that's the bedrock of our ordinance. Mm -hmm. It certainly, as, as we discussed tonight, there's, there's lots of, of, of ways to study it. There's lots of different ways to, to approach these nuances. Um, but it isn't something that just happened in, in 2017 because of a car wash. It's, it's been our overriding theory that once you're, once you're a part of our system, you stay a part of our system. The ordinance just had to be strengthened because. Well, it's you know. just it, what what happened. The ordinances become over time. They, they look like a quilt, really, more than more than a blanket. They they just get little pieces sewn into them, and they get little little. And then sometimes they're redundant, and sometimes the language is a little bit. It's it's not dovetailed perfectly, but the overriding theme has been the same. Yeah. And um, so I, it isn't. It's not, I don't want to lay that at the feet of any particular board. It's been it's been going right. on for a long Ms. time. Miss Lane. Um, I'm not the civil engineer or the water expert, but I certainly think that looking at irrigation right now and maybe redoing the policy for large developments, whether it's magna and umpteen acres or whatever, would be something that we should at least investigate because we are going to grow with residents using single-family homes and I just found out earlier this week that uh, residents have a choice of putting a second meter on if they want a slightly water reduction cost to do irrigation so um, well the reduction I, is the not having to pay the sewer, sewer. correct well whatever the reduction is it's still a reduction and I think when we're looking at this uh, July peak period in the summertime I think as we grow we need to address at least the individual irrigation things and I'm not for everybody who's got a, who's on municipal water in the smaller subdivisions putting in wells or anything like that I'm totally we just eliminating yeah. that from the discussion I think there might be other circumstances where we are not damaging the larger group of people by being more reasonable with something like irrigation. So you would allow the larger subdivision to have it, but not the smaller ones, is what you're saying? No, I'm saying that... Or individuals. I can also tell you that we have two wells in my backyard, one that took care of Knollwood when it was developed and a second one that was put in in 1999 as so that we would have enough backup in a well system if the municipal well system failed at any point. So we continually evaluated the system and have done things. And I think it doesn't, I think it's reasonable to look at the irrigation system and its value or I opposition to I think we said we, we have looked at that. Well, I think we've heard it from our attorney, we've heard it from Mr. Limita. We have done it in previous it from boards Mr. have done it. I don't see it difficulty in looking at it now. I'm not sure what you want to look at, but... I said irrigation systems like for Del Webb for large acreage parcels under one common control. I'm not talking about Mr. your Laddie, subdivision or Mr. anything Laddie, else. If, if we allow Del Webb to do this, do we have to allow individuals as well? Um, we may we may 
have the ability, I guess, depending on depending on what our basis would be, to make a distinction between multiple users, commercial users, industrial, multiple, residential, and individual residential. But be very tough to do that. And, and, and by the way, I mean, it, it's still, even if you do that, it's still contrary to the overall public policy. Once you're hooked in, you stay in. That, that is, that's what I'm getting out of the public safety message here. It's not, about, it's ma not a matter of money. Once the system is sized and once you or a pre your predecessor in title says, I want to be hooked onto this for drinking water and or irrigation, as a matter of public policy, you need to stay on it. And that is, that is a, a different scenario, I think, than, than what Ms. Lane is describing, where people may have, where water has come through a subdivision that, all, that had wells, and then people were allowed to engage in this discussion about whether or not they wanted to right. keep the well That's irrigation. Totally different, different situation. Mm -hmm. So you're going to, so to answer your question, Mr. Supervisor, you're, 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 you're going to use a, a, a shotgun approach for your ordinance. You've got to capture as many people and treat as many people in like manner as you can. And mm -hmm. so it's very hard to, to tweak that to to any sort of precision. Yeah, I just find it difficult that we would pass an ordinance for one group but not everybody. I mean, I, I would choose to put in a well myself if, if we start allowing people. I mean, um, I use enough water <laughs> that uh, that I could pay for it probably in one summer. You know, I can, as I, and this isn't a legal point at all, but I, this is a fascinating topic to everybody from all sides, right? It's got public, it's got public safety, it's got economies of scale, it's got all right down to the individuals, right down to how much a gallon of water costs, how much a bottle of water costs, I think we talked about. This is a great topic to continue to study, I think. And, and we've got a DPW committee, a task force. I think this is something that might need some ongoing discussion, but it's very complicated. And, and, it, and the danger is very real to our system. And, and mm -hmm. um, I could see this being sort of a on the table discussion for our DPW committee for many, for some time to come. And we have a rate study being done too, which we can get input from them as well. Mr. Massey? Uh, <coughs> Mr. Chair, I agree with Attorney Lanning. I think we need to study this in depth and then come back for a later discussion. I'd like some input from some other board members. Mr. Mansour? Yeah, so I was just kind of mapping out here some, some things and going back to my other, uh, uh, other point about modeling peak usage versus the rise in overall uh, water usage. So I'd like to take a look at that. I think it uh, deserves a little more, more study. Mm -hmm. Mr. Atkins? <clears throat> As part of that study, I'd like to understand the second meter option because I do think there's some sort of a solution to help people with irrigation. If they can avoid sewer bill, sure. um, that could be huge for some people that use a lot of water in the summer uh, for irrigation. Although the business case right now is a stretch because it looks like a multi-year payback based off by the time you get a plumber, a permit, a $360 meter. So maybe there's something we can look at as part of that study to figure out if there's some, a few things in there that could be lower cost or... There, um, there's, a, there's definitely a distinction in it. Some people save money with second meter and some people don't. So they, I always encourage people to look at that very closely and it, it really depends on the amount of water you use to irrigate. The more water you use, the more of a payback you're gonna get on that second meter because the sewer charges are dropped off. Do you have some sort of formula or something like maybe you could provide as part of that study? I, I, I mean, I could provide some sample bills or something or maybe some sample usage and how much that would cost and where the payoff could be. I'm sure me and Mr. Potter could figure that out and, and give some data, definitely. Okay. Uh, and I will remind you, the, the irrigation pits that are in Woodfield or in Pulte, they also don't pay sewer charges. Right. So they're just like that second irrigation meter in a home. It's, it's all equally charged. Uh, and it, it, the only different, the difference there's going to be is the size of meter and the RTS cost. The larger the meter, the more you pay for RTS because the more demand I, we have on the system. So, Mr. Guzak, your thoughts? I think we should, you know, look at those all those other items and we have the DPW committee looking at it. Okay. Ms. Lane? Again, not being an expert, but I think I, if I, uh, if I heard correctly, uh, each of the meter pits in these larger developments 
uh, have to be put in or winterized and then opened up again in, in the summertime? Is that, am That's I true. right? Or, yeah, they, and, they're done when the irrigation systems are winterized. Mm -hmm. And what additional cost does that add to a system? We charge based? a $50 turn on, turn off fee. And that covers my technician to go out there, shut the water off, disconnect the meter, and basically be right there with the irrigation company. I pay that for having mine shut off. <laughs> Me, mine too. Yeah. Actually, it's a little bit higher than that. But. Yes. <laughs> I'll give you the name of my guy. What's that? I'll give you the name of my okay. guy. <laughs> I got to have Bert on the mind. Mr. Massey, any closing comments? Otherwise, I guess uh, it sounds like we have a consensus that we'll continue to look at this with our DPW committee. We have a rate study that will be uh, under process for the next couple months, and uh, we'll make sure this is a topic that, that they take a look at. Mr. I, Lady? I agree, I, but I don't, I don't think this is something that's going to come up in 30 days. I don't think it's going to be something that no. is going to be solved in, in 60 or 90. So I think, I think out of fairness to... Um, uh, to uh, Grand Reserve, probably this issue, uh, probably what I'm hearing is that you're not going to amend your ordinance or your policy at this time. You're going to continue to study it, but that, but that the, the horizon for you revisiting this issue as a board, you've not established that yet. And so, and so for all intents and purposes, when they walk out of here tonight, they're, 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 the situation is the same as it was when they walked in. Yeah. And, and until you take it up again, which is at some, again, undetermined point in time, that's when you revisit it. I think so. Um, you know, it, it's tough for me to go against, uh, I, I've said this in other situations, you know, that um, it's difficult for me to go against the, the people that we hire to give us a professional opinion, whether it's uh, you, Mr. Laddie, uh, Mr. Potter, Mr. Sears, Mr. Limita. Um, but I, I think we, we can look at it uh, with our, our rate study and maybe there's something with peak rate, uh, what have you. But um, I think um, we'll we'll continue to take a look at, it, but I don't see anybody willing to take action this evening on it. Uh, Mr. Sears, did you have something? I'm good. Okay. That's all. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, you had final comment here before we move on. Yes. I first I want to start off telling you thank you very much for your time and for reviewing this issue. Would like to just clarify a few things I heard during the meeting. Uh, my CV goes back to being registered 1974 as well. I'm uh, sorry, what was that? My, my, my professional experience goes back to becoming a professional engineer back in 1974 as well. Oh, okay. I've operated uh, City Burton's water system, East Point, Centerline, Harrison Township, several others under contract and as their actual employee. Uh, in the past, I've seen every community I've been in connecting to your house to a public system when it's available has been a no-brainer. The local health department's policy to protect public health, safety, and welfare was that they would not give you a permit for domestic water. They would give you one for a well for some other purpose, but you, if you had a house and your well went bad, you couldn't rebuild if it was a public water outside. You had to connect to public water. You were denied a well permit. So and I don't think we're here, we have not been here asking anything about domestic water. We think it's good public policy that you continue to require that. I do have the problem trying to make the connection between public health and safety in irrigation water, which is not consumed. It's, I don't see the public health and safety aspect of, of regulating that particular area. Yes, rate increases have gone up highly. The national average the last 10 years is the cost of living has been going up about 2%, but the annual rate increases and across the whole U.S. has been going up about 5% for water and for sewer. So overall it's going up. You've been good. You've been controlling it here recently. Tennessee County Drain Commission does allow disconnection, not just of irrigation, of a home as well. There was recently a small condominium complex in Davidson Township where the county actually operates the system on their behalf that made a request and was permitted to do that. And when we did some check to see what the unique facts were, we were told that they would also allow the, actually the, the structures themselves to be disconnected, which pretty surprised me. So the county does not have any regulations that would require this. This is your, this is your ordinance. You have the right to have that ordinance. The uh, 
the issue I have, I think, what it still floats out there is a, you have a police power ordinance. You have a requirement now that you can't disconnect. We existed starting back in 2008. This non-disconnect requirement was imposed in 2016. And I understand there are golf courses that have connected for public water, but they're not being required to irrigate their property with it. They're allowed to have domestic water only. So I'm concerned about the equal treatment between all parties as well. So, and a police power ordinance, there's no grandfathered rights, is my understanding. So if you say something applies to this piece of property, it applies to existing customers as well. I don't see that has happened here with this last requirement, at least as it's in being interpreted for irrigation. So I, th I think the county, the, the county requirement is clear. I pointed out the potential side benefits uh, in my earlier briefing memo about the uh, the impacts on your peak, your max day and your peak hour factors. I know you had those when Detroit was your primary supplier, and it sounds like the uh, KWA has got a very similar model. So that that will go up, and. Uh, it is, your, uh, as much as your example of electrical, because a lot of that cost is having to run extra pumps and getting their their demand above the threshold that they have from the electric utilities, and they have major increases in their power costs to to run those pumps. So, you know, it's a very complex subject. We are certainly available to assist and comment any way we can. We thank you for your consideration, and I, I hope that. The study and evaluation can proceed on a reasonably prompt basis. Thank you. Well, we appreciate you for your, you know, cordialness and for all the study that uh, you put into this and for the time, you know, for you and your other residents to look at this. And uh, we certainly take it seriously. Um, I know that Davison Township, I believe, is taking over their responsibility for uh, water and sewer, from what their supervisors told me. And Good. I think part of it is they haven't been pleased with. How things have run so um, anyways with that being said uh, we appreciate your time thank, thank you <coughs> feel free to come and see us anytime Thanks. with that um, and I, I just want to say we don't take any of these issues lightly um, you know we we know that uh, our residents um, you know, have concerns uh, like this, and anytime a resident or a group of residents come to us, we, I think our board takes those concerns seriously, and uh, this is no different. So we'll continue to, to study it and see if there's some way that we can accommodate uh, lower rates for, for everybody, okay? Under uh, our next item under uh, operational issues is the board will consider a motion to approve the change to invoice cloud for the township's payment vendor and authorize the superintendent to execute all necessary agreements. We spoke about this on, on Tuesday and uh, I think it's going to be a great benefit to our residents uh, as well as uh, anybody who's doing any kind of work in the township, whether it's permits for fences, deck permits, uh, water, what have you. Uh, Mr. Lehman, any comments on this? Uh, I know you spoke at length on Tuesday to describe it, but... Just uh, one like? follow-up, but I believe it was Trustee Thomas that asked about what they charge for any chargebacks on credit yes. cards. The answer to that is $15, um, but our standard is we charge $30 because of staff time associated with right. uh, the collection. Uh, so they charge 15 we charge 30 uh, I can tell you that we have, um, with the credit card payments that we take now, it has not been an issue. It, 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 they are so few and far between on credit cards, primarily it's with an ACH with okay. checking accounts, um, which is basically the same thing. We charge mm -hmm. $30 for those as well. Mr. Okay. Chair, I'd Thanks. be glad to make the motion to approve this transfer. Okay. Support. Any discussion? I have one. Yes, Mr. Massey. Uh, Superintendent, with this new system, allow us in a timely fashion to detect water leaks? So this is really just about the payments, but with the, and Mr. Sears can certainly talk about um, WaterSmart, uh, and one of the reasons that we selected uh, Invoice Cloud over Point and Pay is because um, that online 
portal with water smart uh, does interact with this invoice cloud and so there is potential for water smart to be able to um, highlight those water leaks in a much quicker fashion sure we're going to talk about water smart early on in 2020 and what that is is it's a software that we can utilize as a customer portal for um, our customers to use to monitor their water utility accounts basically uh, what it will do is it will give them more options to make payments through Invoice Cloud. Uh, it gives them reminder options. It gives them the ability to set alarms for their water usage. It gives them the ability to go on monthly, daily, whatever, and uh, pull up some real-time information, graphs, whatever they may have to uh, look at their water usage real close. It gives them clues on how to lower their water usage. If it alerts them to a leak, it'll, it actually has a, a system that will take them through a process to find a leak uh, of all the most common areas. So it's a really neat software that we'll look at that uh, it was primarily, uh, we were actually quite excited when we first looked at it and they, they said they work with Invoice Cloud because we know we knew the finance department was also looking at Invoice Cloud. So. It is the, the two softwares together are going to be a, a, a huge tool for our residents and for the township also uh, in, the, in the near future. So, you know, one of the things right now, uh, individuals get billed quarterly, of, uh, not to get off on water billing, but um, so right now you've got to wait like three months to see where you're at with your That's water right. Right. as opposed to this water smart that would allow you to look daily to see what your water All usage is. Correct. Um, so if you if you had a problem with a leak or what have you, you could, you know, get an alarm set that, hey, guess what? Uh, you know, your usage is jump, mm -hmm. you know, spiked, so you can take care of it immediately. Absolutely. I like the idea of being able to have several different options to pay, though, besides having to come in or mail a right. check. Mr. Guzak? Yeah, I just had a question because I thought we had some capabilities that your staff could go in, like if I had a water problem, you could go back in and look at the system and see yeah. we can. with my usage yeah. and, and but, but you because can. we had a computer system. We, we absolutely not, can. Right. Our, we bought that a while back, but right. we're not monitoring it that much? No, no, we do. Our FlexNet system does the same thing. What this does is it takes the control of your utility and puts it with you. So you take not, it on your so you smartphone. Let them look at it instead of us. Looking. Absolutely. Both. I mean, we have uh, you know 7,500, 8,000 water customers right now. I can't look at every water right. account every every month. Well, so I knew we had a system it, that was similar. That's why right. you know the distinction. Well, That's why I was trying to clarify. Our it. system monitors the, the it does. big parts of the of the system. What we're talking about is being able to monitor on your phone uh, your own individual system, so that correct. Hey, guess what? I'm I'm over my budget. No more watering this month. Right, and yeah. people want to take control of that stuff. So, I think I think it's a great addition. So, no more discussion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, the next item is uh, the board will consider a resolution to amend the Green Valley Special Assessment Rule, approved in March. The cost was revised from. Well, we've had a couple of revisions, but. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, I'm just going to give the revised cost is $326,568.79. I'll make the motion. Support. Thanks, sir. Resolution. Okay. okay. It, uh, been, the motion's been passed and it's been uh, seconded. Any further discussion? Ms. Lane? Mr. Mansour? Yes. Mr. Adkins? Yes. Mr. Guzak? Yes. Mr. Massey? Yes. Myself? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Thank you. Item C on our agenda, the board will consider approval of a resolution to renew an agreement between the township and Michigan Department of Transportation, where the township will continue to maintain the I-75 Dixie Highway Park and Ride and authorize the township superintendent to execute all related agreements and contracts. So moved. Okay. Seconded. Seconded. Any discussion? We talked about this at length on Tuesday. Um, I think everybody's pretty clear how that works. Our costs are covered and we maintain it. And I think I, I like that agreement have, that we maintain it and keep it to our standards. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, That's a resolution. I'm sorry, Ms. Lane. Mr. Mancy. Yeah. Mr. Massey or Mr. Mancy? Mr. Massey. Yes. <laughs> Myself. Mr. Manzor. Yes. Mr. Atkins. Yes. Mr. Gruzak. Yes. Mr. Bennett. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the board will consider. Uh, a motion to approve the vehicle use policy number 
O2-01. Uh, Mr. Limita or Mr. Laddie? Uh, based on our conversation on uh, Tuesday, and this um, policy was lifted almost well, pretty much word for word with the addition of a few things right out of our employment manual. Like I said on Tuesday, we have a policy about uh, township vehicles. One of the things that was raised was what happens with um, people who are not necessarily employees of the township, whether it's Parks and Rec uh, employees or if it um, can be the Board of Review members that uh, will take a pool car to training and people who are not necessarily employees but they're appointed in some fashion. So I lifted that, in, that language right from there, uh, right out of our manual, and then what I changed, if you look at the scope, was to include that the, the policy would apply to any person authorized use of a township owned or leased vehicle, including all employees, board members, planning commission, board review, and any members or employees of the various committees or commissions for the township. Employees operating under the policy is required for a CDL pursuant to uh, DOT regulations are still covered under that policy, but also under this policy where applicable. Uh, we do have a separate uh, obviously CDL policy that uh, they're required to follow. I also included the separate policy that the police department is required to follow um, just for your information. We put in here that the procedures will that employees will have a valid driver's license verified as part of the background check at hire which is what we do now for all township uh, employees but before any approved use of a vehicle by a non-employee authorized driver they have to provide a copy of their valid Michigan driver's license will be provided I also included periodic checks of driving records may be performed at the expense of the township in order to remain eligible for township vehicle use. All drivers consent to provide that authorization for review. Um, we can put that as a firm date that they're run once a year, once every two years, once every three years. Uh, one corporation I worked for, we just automatically was done every three years. I didn't know where the board wanted to be or if you just wanted the ability to run those um, periodically. Uh, it, it, it's solely up to the board, but um, I was hoping that this policy might help address some of the concerns that were expressed on Tuesday. Thank you. Mr. Atkins? I'd just like to um, add to that to offset any cost of a third party to investigate if we could do those checks internally through our police department or, um, you know, maybe get some clarification on that just to reduce any cost of a third party. It, question. Go ahead. Is wondering. there anything, um, Trustee Atkins, from your standpoint as far as like the um, how often we would that the board would like to see those run or is it you know an annual thing or a biannual or just as yeah. long as we keep the policy that we're gonna run them periodically. It, yeah, I'm I, I I'd let that kinda up to you to set whatever frequency that falls in line with whatever other departments are doing. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Yes, Mr. Mr. Chair, I would like to say, I think the uh, police chief would have more expertise in that area than we do. So I'd like to hear his comments, uh, uh, input, whatever we may have tonight in that regard. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. Um, I think Superintendent Lehman said you have the police department policy. I apologize, I misspoke yesterday in reference to our policy when I said three years, that's clearly not what we do. We do the we do driving histories in the police department yearly, criminal histories every two years in the police department. Um, I did do some investigating in the possibility of us being able to do driving records for township drivers outside of the police department. Um, I spoke with our um, TAC, which is our terminal agency coordinator, she was the one who coordinates uh, lean responses to make sure that we're um, abiding by the law and not breaking any administrative rules which would revoke our lean privileges which is a big deal in law enforcement. Initially she said you know I think we can do that um, but then she did some more research to try to find some documentation to show that we could do that and she was mistaken we cannot um, run driving records for non-police department employees. Um, she did find some documentation that there is a free service through the Secretary of State um, that will run them for government employees and um, she's giving me some uh, increased documentation to tell you how to do that and where to go to get that done. But it wouldn't be through the police department. Okay. Mr. Mayor, sir. Okay, a couple, of, a couple of things. First, while we're on this topic, uh, just, uh, you know, someone can make the final decision, but I mean, for me, uh, running a driving record every two to three years would be, you know, pretty suffi sufficient. Uh, but I do like, uh, and I think it was, you mentioned in your policy, where if there was a, um, uh, a violation 
it was required to have some kind of a self-report. Correct. So uh, I don't know if that, that um, mm -hmm. you know, after a couple of years, you know, you can have a lot happen in a couple of years. So maybe there there could be something inserted in the policy that to kind of uh, recognize recognize that. Oh, oh, okay. Well, an accident, but that's kind of different than necessarily a violation. Uh, the second the second thing was. Uh, when we say before any approved use, do, do we imply that that's like immediately before, or can I, or can I give you my driver's license a month before or two months before? Yeah, it, it, what I meant when I um, put that in there is, I was the thought that if we have uh, board of review members or something like that that know that they're going to ask for a pool car to attend yep. a training, that somebody would come forward and say, "Can we have the pool car?" And we say, "Absolutely." What we need is a copy of the driver's license. So, as they arrange the pool car, that would be plenty of time for us to even run a check if we wanted to. Yeah, well, okay, I just wanted you know, just uh, it's before kind of is you can kind of interpret that a lot of different ways. So, uh, Mr. Mansur, just done that one point though with regard to you know, we have, there's a paragraph in here that for self-reporting of accidents. Right. But you're saying, what would you have them self-report other than that? Well, I don't know if I had a DUI or something. How do you like that. word that in yours? I mean, any significant? Yeah, I, I, I would think it would be important if someone found their driver's license, their driving privileges suspended or revoked. That that would be important to know. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering how you define it in the policy. You know, rather than. I, you know. I think that we could probably put in there about the self-reporting. I can add a a line in there that says um, that it, it's either. Uh, anything that would be considered above a you know a ninety day misdemeanor or um, like a DUI yeah. or a uh, suspended or revoked license must be reported Suspe immediately. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, that's fair. And then okay. then uh, uh, indulge me two more here. Um, it says in case of an accident and report is needed, the employee shall be responsible for the police report. What do we mean by that? I mean, do I get to fill my own out, or I mean? No, you have to provide the police report because if it didn't occur here, I'm not going to have a problem if it occurred in the township because I'm going to call Ron. <laughs> for, for, for providing the police report. For, for providing okay. a copy of the police report. Okay. Gotcha. Because for them to be able to get it released, I don't know that I can necessarily call and ask for a copy of the police report. Okay. So if I'm in any kind of accident, you know, say I'm a township employee and I get in an accident, uh, you know, it's nothing significant, but. In you I run into uh, yeah, I run into uh, there's a bicycling accident, <laughs> but uh, I back into somebody's car or whatever. I need to provide that police report to the township. I mean, I'm not driving a township vehicle. I'm just in my own vehicle or whatever. But no, it's I only a, this is the township vehicle use policy. Right. Yeah. Okay, so not necessarily self-reporting it because we're talking about self-reporting it if i get a dui i need to report that whether i was in a township vehicle or not right but suspended revoked or dui yes you have to report because that impacts your ability right. to have a that valid driver's, you know, valid driver's license right. which is required by the policy but an accident would only be if, if i'm in a township vehicle that i need to report right. that at the police department we self-report any accident in a township mm -hmm. vehicle if you if you're in a cruiser and you back into a light pole that's self-reported because we need to define that a little bit right. better. Because right now it looks like if I'm in an accident, I don't care whether I'm doesn't say driving a township vehicle, but if I'm in an accident in my own vehicle, use of township. But then we vehicle. also say, you know, if it's a DUI, you need to report it. So Absolutely. somehow we just need to clarify those two things. And, I think. But and some of those, and I don't know all the township policies for for over here, but some of those may be included in other policies where. You report arrests to your okay. supervisor mm -hmm. or, or reporting person. I don't know if that policy exists over on this side. Okay. And then the last item was uh, we mentioned uh, non prescription drug, alcohol use, strictly prohibited. Um, we don't mention in here anything to do with smoking. And I don't know if that's, I mean, in all the company vehicles I've ever been a part of, I mean, it's always been a requirement. Rules. We do have a separate smoking policy that requires no smoking in township vehicles okay. or that's fine. anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Thank uh, you. Mr. Atkins. Just because you hear it in the paper a lot of, you know, a few, ins, uh, a few times government employees get in a little uh, um, situation with a car and then it gets questionable because police reports are made three, four, five days later or something like that. Is it reasonable to say that, do you, do you think there needs to be any language in there to protect any of that? I mean, do you... 
see that as so so by law if you have a thousand dollars worth of damage to your vehicle or the other vehicle as a result of a car accident it has to be reported immediately to law enforcement i didn't even know that yeah. how long do they have to prepare the police report that that varies by agency i would say in in 99 of the cases that we've done within two days Typically, just for procedural purposes, the, when you get in a crash, if you haven't been in one, the officer taking the crash will give you a card, typically, right. with a complaint number. So then you or whoever can oh, contact well. that police department. Um, a lot of places are going to electronic um, accident reports, so you can go online and get a copy of that report after you pay a nominal fee, of course. I was just thinking if we put any restriction on how many days it had to be, there might be I, some that don't I have to I think we should have it within 24 hours. I just put another line that just added that the accident reporting is to occur within 24 hours if you're in any type of 24 hours. Because mm -hmm. just in case we suspected somebody that we need to send them out for a substance abuse mm -hmm. test when right. they came in and said they signed yes. to leave yeah, the bar parking in the lot. pool car, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> It well, sounds like we have a few amendments to it that we can come Maybe back to us next meeting with. Fourth, yeah, fourth Tuesday meeting. Yep. Okay. okay, thank you, Mr. Or Chief Wiles. Okay, uh, we'll do something on that the fourth Tuesday then with regard to the vehicle policy. Um, item E was regarding the transfer of the Silverado to uh, the Parks Commission or to actually to. Board will consider a motion to approve the transfer of the DPW's 2004 Silverado 2500 with the VIN number ending in 31512 for $6,000 and authorized township superintendent to execute all related contracts and documents. Uh, Mr. Lehman provided us with the uh, policy that the Parks and Rec has in place currently. Um, do you want to go ahead and do this this evening? I'm, I'll make a motion. Support. Okay. Okay. I have a question. Uh, discussion, Mr. Atkins. Uh, do we have any discounts on insurance if you have a vehicle that you use that you do not use on public roadways? That if it was just uh, um, isolated to just park use, is that still considered a full coverage vehicle? Because we still have a park insurance policy on its own if it's not used on public roads can you is there a different type of policy or I, I don't know the answer to that question I mean it, there may be something if it's not going to be out on the road that it's only a um, we're going to limit it that it's never going to be out on the road but then we're going to have the issue of making sure that we have some sort of fuel tank or something on the park to refuel the vehicles out. okay it might be more problematic but <clears throat> well you'd have maintenance problems too because you couldn't take it out of the park right no, you How do you get no. serviced? Well, I, I being know. in that field, I, and I, I insure vehicles that uh, are just primarily used on parking lots for plowing. Um, if there is any savings, it, it's you know not a ton, but uh, um, the, the problem, like Mr. Guzak says, would be you know fueling and repairs, and, and, and our if maintenance you have to, gets done here, and our maintenance on the vehicle gets done here. Okay. So. Okay. All right, good question though. Mr. Uh, Miss, Miss Lane? We are still going to keep the title in the township's name and we're, mm -hmm. we've resolved all the liability concerns that anybody had from Tuesday night. Well, I think we're saying in combination with what the parks has already as far as a policy and what Mr. Lehman I have in place as of probably looks like maybe the fourth Tuesday our board will. I think those two things will resolve the concern that, that I think we had. If not, let's hear about it. But oh, I, I think we have a consensus at this point. Okay, so we've had a motion that's been seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so uh, we reviewed, we had the uh, department heads on Tuesday give kind of an overview of uh, each of their departments and their budget, and we appreciate uh, their time in being here and uh, the preparation they put into. The presentation I thought it was uh, very helpful to understanding uh, some of the economies that they've been able to reach over the past year or two and also to uh, look at what uh, projects they're looking at for the next year or two and uh, how that's going to affect maybe some budget issues. Uh, we asked uh, 
Mr. Sears and Mr. Wiles, Dr. Chief Wiles, Dr. Wiles. It isn't doctor yet, is it? <laughs> uh, Chief Wiles to uh, come back to our meeting. I think uh, what we wanted to do is just, I know that you're going to be giving a full-blown presentation in November with regard to your budgets, and you're still, uh, I, I guess you're almost finished with those, but uh, I think we wanted to maybe uh, ask you some questions that uh, maybe you can make sure you address in November in those presentations. Um, so I guess uh, Mr. Sears, or I'll call you Dr. Sears, Dr. Sears. Doctor's and, great, thank you. I think it was Ken maybe that asked you to, or Mr. Thomas that asked you to be here, but- uh, Mr. Atkins did. Oh, Mr. Atkins, okay. So are there, any particular areas, Mr. Atkins, that you would like to see us look into at the DPW? I was going to wait till the full presentation and the water rate study comes back. I apologize, yeah. I should have mentioned that Tuesday night, but I think it's important. Do, do you think the water rate study will be back before your full presentation? Uh, I, I sure do hope so. Uh, you do, they, um, when we talked to them last, they said that they would be done in November. It could be pushed to December. I hope that I have enough information to know whether um, what is going to happen, at least some kind of rendition. Oh, I hope we at least have a draft by then. Did you get any kind of... Uh, we'll have the first iteration of their, of their work next month. Typically though, there's going to be a couple of iterations. So we could report back, this is where we're at at this point. But the other thing that's going to affect it is the county's in the middle of a race study for, the, for their work. And one of the things that I asked them to look at their rate study is the peak month concept that they're using now. And try to look at something that's got a three year rolling or something that doesn't have a, such an immediate impact on the rate. So they're looking at that. And I, don't, I, know, I think they're on their second or third iteration in their rate study. So some of this is going to depend on where their rates end up falling and how it's going to impact us. So I think we can report back next month during the budget presentation. This is where we're at, this is the trend that we're seeing for something like that. I'm not sure we can have definitive answers though. I guess you do I have, you do have uh, before you an amended budget from me and an amended um, CIP from me. We did, uh, you asked that we bring that to you anytime there's changes. We added a small project to that, so I wanted to make sure the board knew um, because we will be bringing uh, design for that project before long. So I wanted to make you aware of it. And it's we just, updated some costs in that. Yeah. Case, so. I have some general question, a general question for you. That, Absolutely. Um, and there's no stupid questions, right? No right. stupid questions at all. Mm -hmm. um, this rate study, how much could it have an effect on our budget? Um, I mean, what do you foresee? I mean, boy, that's that's tricky. On our budget itself, I don't think it's going to have much of an effect on our budget. Um, I feel like I have a pretty um, accurate grasp on our operating costs. And I feel like what they're going to look at is do our rates accurately support our operating costs, which I feel like they do. Um, and, are, oops, go ahead. No, and, and are we, have we structured those charges in the most cost effective way for all of the users? I mean, that's one of the key things that we're looking at. They're going to look at the cost of what it takes to operate the system, but they're also going to look at the, at the way that we have our RTS and our commodity charges and our capital fees and those kind of things to make sure that we're doing it in the most fair way for, for all the users across the board. That's one of the big things. This, but in terms of impact of the budget, I would say that it's probably going to be minimal. Okay. This, is a, this is a very solid budget in my opinion and uh, I, I don't see any changes to that. It's the revenues that we're going to look at and, and I really don't see many changes to that either. It's mostly the structure that we're going to look at, I think. How we break down the costs and are, they, are we... Absolutely. You know, whether the ready to serve charge is appropriate versus the rate. How's it being allocated? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yep. So some things might get changed around. We might come back to the Probably. board and say, hey, we, we, we need to change some ready to serve or what Absolutely. have you. Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Massey? Mr. Uh, uh, Chair, I have a question yes. for uh, Dr. Sears. Doctor, yes. Yes. The question is, uh, where do I find the graveyard costs in the budget? The graveyard cost. Yes, cemetery. cemetery, cemetery. Oh, cemetery. Okay, I'm sorry. Those are in the general fund under public services. Public services. 
Oh, okay. There's three accounts there. There's an account each for uh, Perry McFarland, for Oakwood Cemetery, and for um, uh, I, I said Oakwood, and for uh, and what's and the other one? Public Maple Gibson. 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 Public service. Maple Gibson. Public service. And, and I want to say they're each about five thousand dollars a year. Five thousand for four. Maple, thirty-five hundred for Perry, and three thousand for Oakwood. Does that include the cost per plot? No, sir. That is the cost for maintenance. maintenance. So that's maintenance. that's the cost for mowing and the cost for my employees to do routine maintenance. So what do you find the cost for? Where do we get the cost from? Yes. From our mowing contract. No, I mean for the... Uh, oh, where do we get the revenues from? Yes. Those revenues are basically, they, they, cut, they have funds, they each have a, a bank account, and it's basically interest off of the bank account. What about the fees for purchasing the cemetery plot? That is in the fee schedule. That's, it's in there, but that's not a, a real huge um, revenue stream. We may have 10 burials a year between all three of our cemeteries. Our new what's, what's the cemetery plot run? Is that in the I fees? think $400. they're $400 here in the township. Or 50 it's, for non-residents. Yep. $400 for township and city residents, $450 for non-residents, $300 for the use of the chapel. Opening and closing of graves is done by the Genesee Vault arranged by the funeral home. Who logs that? It's a bargain. What's Who that? Logs it's a bargain. Who, Who logs, logs the, the sale? Clerk's department. The clerk's department. The clerk's department. So do we keep track of all the sales and what have you? Or? Yes, we do, and we keep track of the burials, too. We updated uh, the cemetery software component, uh, part of uh, BSNA. Um, Clerk Lane, when she be came on uh, three years ago, had requested that we uh, add that module to our BSNA software. We did, and, and so everything gets tracked through the cemetery module there. Okay. And who's we... wherever they are in the cemetery. Okay. Do we set aside a percentage of the sale for perpetual care? The entire amount goes into the bank account. Does it? Yeah. For perpetual care? Yeah. How much capacity do we have remaining at our cemeteries? Um, probably the one wise. that has the most room is going to be um, Maple. Maple Gibson. Um, Oakwood has some room, some unplotted property. Um, and then Perry McFarland probably has the least amount of open spots. So they have like 20% you think available or 50%? Oh. No, there's, there's probably... 30%, uh, 35% at, uh, like, oh my gosh. Do you guys have a layout of the cemetery? We do. Yep. It's all laid out in and the GIS plot. system. Yep. Yep. It, it's all GPS. The location? Yep. And et cetera? Yep. Okay. So we know what's sold this year and mm -hmm. we could easily get that information. Okay. I'm just concerned because I, I know that there's some issues with cemeteries and. All right in uh, the state and in our county in particular. And, and we monitor all of that very closely. Um, mm -hmm. I do have some past experience in cemeteries. I go to a conference every year. Doesn't sound real exciting, but I learn a lot of things and I make a lot of connections. I, I did meet a lady, a young lady from the MTA mm -hmm. who I have been communicating with about okay. that specific situation. So. All right, very good. Uh, Mr. Atkins, then Ms. Lane. Uh, with the cloud uh, thing we talked right. about earlier, will you be able to buy a, a, a burial plot on a, plot on a credit card now? Will that be linked to that? Yeah, or? absolutely. Yeah. Everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. January 1st. Absolutely. That's okay. when I estimate we'll start it. Well, you don't, you'd have to be able to, do you get to choose which plot you want? Absolutely. Yes, you do. As long so as you, it's vacant. Except that you would, I'm saying online though, because of online, no. If no, one that's, sitting at home, we, right, would there be an interactive map? I so C2. There, there are softwares that you can do that. I don't think our cemeteries are robust enough to pay for such a. <laughs> because I'm just no. saying, if he wants to pay online, I mean, it's like, well, we have. Uh, GIS maps available of our cemeteries that are color coded to show what's available and what's right. sold, and those are, old. Um, and those are online. I right. think you can get. I them. have hard copies too for those that want them. Oh, I might see so those somebody things. would be able to at least go online, look at the map, maybe discuss it, call the clerk's office, and say, "Hey, I want to." And I've gone out with people to walk the lots. 
and then have them run the credit card over the phone, or I think they could do it online. They could pay for it. Yeah, absolutely. We've, we've oh, got and the then say, hey, the button on there to pay here, and we make it so that you can pay the cemetery lot, so it's paid. And then uh, you just choose like D six or whatever. I, mean, I don't know. Gotcha. I think that's that it would be January. more of us. You're going to go online <laughs> and pay the fee, and we'll be able to assign the plot you choose in the office. I mean, okay. the cemetery is all we responsible for. Three. 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 We're currently three. responsible for three. Three. <clears throat> Uh, I would like, I think that Mr. Laddie and I go as far as Oakwood, it is so old and I'm going to use the word fragile, it might not be, we're not selling anymore in Oakwood. That's on Leech Lane and is surrounded by single, a few single family plots. But the others have enough Capacity. that we could all fit in one. All right. Mr. Mansour? At the risk of stopping this lively conversation about cemeteries, can we uh, set a, a date where we could, as a board, maybe spend uh, three or four hours to go through uh, DPW and police? Well, we're going to go through it at our next board meeting. Well, when are I, you scheduled? I have wait, a presentation wait, the... prepared for the DPW for the next committee of the whole. So, beginning of November. November. Okay. Second um, Tuesday in November? No. November 8th. This is October. So our fourth okay. Tuesday? No, no. ma'am. November. I mean, he could do I, fourth I, Tuesday if that's what. Are you available at? I have to check my calendar. I could be. Yeah. I didn't think we wanted to wait till November to get it. Uh, Mr. Massey but wanted to wait till after I, the I think we should wait to November. What we've done in the past is we've gotten to the general fund budget before we went to the DPW funds because the general fund budget's more critical of being approved. The DPW funds don't necessarily need to be approved right away like the well, general fund does. I mean, legally, you don't have to approve the DPW right. budget. It's an enterprise fund and it's required that we have that balanced budget thing, but I mean, we have to approve the general fund. We've always put the DPW budget into the approval process because I think it's important that the board as a whole approves all of our budgets mm -hmm. uh, moving forward. So that's Correct. why we've always done it. Um, but I think that whatever the board needs, if we'd like to do it sooner and schedule a date, I don't, I, Mr. Sears has this presentation, I believe, ready it's to ready. go. So um, if, you know, following Trustee Mansour's suggestion, if you guys want to pick another date to come in and, and to go through those two budgets, I, I think it's a great option. Mr. I think, Massey. I think November is most important. I, okay. Sure. Um, yeah. When are you thinking, Mr. Massey, the, the Committee of the Whole meeting, yes. November 8th? Yes, November 8th. Ms. Lane? Uh, previous boards, and I am going to suggest that we schedule some special meetings so we're just dealing with the budget and not other items so that we can concentrate. And I, November is getting into Thanksgiving and things like that. I think the few weeks that are left in October would be prime times to have some special time set aside for the budgets, and that's the way we've done it in previous boards. So I don't oh, want to wait all, till November. We've we've done all sorts of things. I mean, the previous I boards. I mean, there's been some that have, but been some that haven't too. But. Uh, Mr. So, Mr. Massey would like us to wait till the November 8th. Yes. Um, Ms. Lane is suggesting scheduling some special time. Uh, I know Mr. Sears is getting it ready for the, uh, is the first meeting November 8th? Is that when the... Uh, I think it's 12th, I think, is for the first meeting in November, right? Is that? It's the second Tuesday. Yep. Yeah, somebody have the calendar? 12th. 12th? November 12th. Okay. If we wait till November 12th, we may have a preliminary um, rate study rate study back also. I don't see us having any information from them before then. I don't even, I can't guarantee you that we'll have something by November 12th, but there's a better possibility. One of the things, I don't know, I know with the, with the police budget, um, tell you what, let's, let's hold off on deciding that. Uh, Chief Wiles, I know we ask you to be here too. If you could come up just for a minute. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sears. Yep. I know we'd spoken earlier and with regard to your budget, Chief, I don't know, do you have any comments? Um, I know that most of yours, you know, looking at your budget, uh, which is 
you know, obviously a big portion of our, our township budget overall, but most of these things are contractual, am I right? I mean, up until one of the bottom lines here, I don't know. Yeah, you, you are correct. Um, you know, looking at the, the expense portion of it, um, if you go down to the bottom of the page, about an inch and a half up, that whole top of the page is all contractual items that um, really little or no control, they're contractually obligated. Um, but the last inch and a half and then the um, next page, half page, next page are, are items that... Uh, so basically from there. about uh, where it says uh, compute office supplies, Correct. From there down. So if you go over to the right hand column where it says ten thousand dollars, from there down is are the things that we could have any effect on. The rest is all contractual with uh, employees, police, what have you. Well, employees and police and things related to employment. Was there anything specific that we wanted the chief to prepare for? I know we, we wanted him here tonight. We're asking him to be here. Was there anything we wanted to direct him to look to be able to talk about when we put together the presentation? Yes, Mr. Atkins. Just one uh, one question maybe you can clarify sure. uh, right now. So for the um, Flint Area Narcotics Grant, uh -huh. Fang, is the will that continue going? It looks like the um, the usage or the reimbursement so far. Do you expect that to still by the year end add up to what it has? I do. Okay. Uh, currently, our agreement with uh, we have one officer assigned to the Flint area area narcotics group. Um, they uh, on the revenue page you'll see forty five thousand dollars from Fang. That is what they reimburse for our our officer to be out there. The remaining expenses picked up by the township. Um, there is some grant uh, overtime that that officer is responsible for. That's the height of grant you'll see in the revenue. That's being um, related for the for that officer. Okay. That's reimbursed. You expect to see that? I do. Program continue? I do. Okay. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mansour. So uh, is I, am I correct in uh, seeing that in terms of the revenue that we've captured here, the increased revenue from the school for the liaison officers, <clears throat> And in addition, the expected additional uh, revenue from the Ally Challenge? Correct. I, I, I did notice the Ally Challenge, the new revenue was on there, the $25,000, which was up from $12,000 that first year. And I believe the school resource officers' uh, positions were also updated uh, to show the, the additional reimbursement. I, see, I don't see the initial $12,000 in this uh, history here. It, it is not, because when that became available to us, if that's how much they were going to reimburse. We already been through this process and it had been uh, uh, approved by the board, the 18 budget. So we didn't go back and amend it for the additional that revenue? I, I don't believe so. It had to have been picked up in revenue somewhere, um, and I'll find that out from finance where that $12,000 was picked up from Trustee Mansour. Mr. Atkins? It's a small amount of money, but because um, it just happens to be a point of contention with me with insurance rates. Yeah. Um, so for the $4 per report for accident report copies to insurance companies, how do you pick that rate? Like, could it be double? Could it be... Yeah, there, there is no statute or, or law um, or rule that um, dictates what that number can be. And that's billed right to the insurance company, right? Correct. Well, there's individuals that buy them through, though. Right? Oh, certainly, there are individuals that come and say, "Hey, I need a copy of my accident report." Uh, we are one of those electronic crash report agencies, so a lot of the insurance companies they will go through the electronic portal um, to get that, and then we get a check from the company, our electronic partner, um, for a check for that the reimbursement of those reports that were selected. Mr. Laddie, is there anything? I mean, can we charge? I know with some of our fees, we can't charge more than what the actual cost is, right? Yeah, we're limited to just what is that it costs the case with this? It is. So we've looked at it and determined that four dollars is pretty much our. Well, it actually is a service that's that's charging the fee for accessing it. What you, Mr. Mr. Chair, I have a question. I don't quite understand what you mean by four dollars. And the attorney said that's probably 
uh, what the fee is. Can you expound on that, what you mean by $4? In other words, if I get a report, I come in for an accident report, uh, I give you $4 for it. That's $4. Correct. Well, let me ask you a question, because the attorney raised an interesting thought. What about those municipalities that charge $12? I, I don't know what municipalities you're, you're referring to or the size of the report that they're getting. Um, if, if we, for instance, take it outside of the accident report. We also charge for police reports. If, you're, you have a, if your car is broken into and you say, I'll let a copy of that police report, yes. um, we charge $4 for that. However, if it's a homicide report, that report is quite lengthy. There's a lot of stuff with it and it falls under the FOIA, FOIA rules and there's additional charges and fees that would go on that would be much more than $4. Then you can start charging time of the employee putting it together and that, that fee goes up very quickly. But I guess my question is now, based on your comment, is that there's no set standard for what you can charge? Not that I'm aware of unless no, the Attorney Laddie knows, knows, knows different. Yeah, it, just, it works. It, it really just sort of follows the pattern of, of a FOIA request. Really, right. I mean, you just want to, try to, you want to try to account for the time it takes for the lowest qualified employee to assemble that information and then the copy costs are essentially fixed. And so they may vary from report to report depending on how complicated they are oh, okay. or how expensive okay. they are. Um, but really it's supposed to just reflect the actual cost, right? It can't be, it can't be a money making. Oh, okay. 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 And these are our residents probably mostly that are paying for these things, I would guess. Well, but no. cr crash reports probably a, a mixed bag, but you know, right. police reports for the most part. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. What I'd like to do is to, to leave it right now for the committee of the whole. However, uh, we can. I think we're going to have some things going on between now and then that uh, are going to require some some of our time, um, maybe more than previous boards uh, had to do. But uh, we can always, uh, between now and then, schedule some some additional times if we find that we have some some available time uh, for the board to meet. But uh, let's. Uh, Let's go as scheduled right now with our, our next committee of the whole. We could. If, if we excuse me, if we have any uh, in, any questions or anything in the interim, we can circulate Absolutely. them to uh, uh, Superintendent Lehman to yeah. copy you. Maybe. Uh, I would urge everybody to take a look, you know, a thorough look at the budget because you know, for example, as we mentioned with with the police department, I mean, you see what what the you know expenses are and. Other than the contractual expenses, there isn't a lot of room in there for much uh, changing. I mean, I would also, this right-hand column, the far right-hand column on here, is a, I would, you know, make that the board column. So that if you, you see areas that, hey, we need to change this number, um, use that as the column to mark them in. Um, there isn't room on the printer to be able to print, you know, board, um, suggested changes but uh, certainly use it that way but uh, I would say you know take a look through it and if you have any questions uh, email Mr. Lehman and myself and if, yes just suggestion uh, all the department heads are available and be happy to answer questions um, I think the most important thing though is if one of you has a question on a specific feel free to call the department head straight out and, and have that conversation but just know that either relay that out to the fellow board of trustees or relay it through me and I'll send it out the, the Q&A so that other people can take advantage of, of you getting your questions um, mm -hmm. answered as well. Right. We just can't have board discussion, but information we definitely can share. But I would, I would encourage everybody, I mean, I think the budget's pretty straightforward and I mean, it's <laughs> wide open, so if anybody has any questions, all right. Anything else on budget? Next topic that uh, I know I, I heard crickets last time I brought this up, and that's with regard to uh, the strategic planning process. Uh, I still believe that uh, we need to have a strategic plan. Uh, you know, we're talking about parks and rec. We've got uh, $300,000 a year to, uh, to put into capital improvements. I'm not one that likes to do things piecemeal, but uh, I know that's what you do when you don't have a plan. Um, we kind of hurried up and put together our current uh, fire department. Um, it'd be nice to have a plan saying where do we want to be in three to five years. And talking to a number of our board members, I know we feel crunched for time with, with us going through the budget right now. 
and whether or not we're going to have enough time to do the budgeting and um, doing some strategic planning um, to address that concern. I think it kind of goes hand in hand a little bit in that, uh, for example, Parks and Rec, uh, as we put together our strategic plan for it, it will help us to figure out, I mean, we can go back and amend our budget, but it will help us um, with our budgeting process so that uh, we know if we want to stick more money into capital improvements than, than what we currently have. Um, it would also help us uh, in any other department that if we have future plans, whether it's signage, you name it. Um, so I still am a proponent that uh, I think we could do both the budgeting. I think this actually would fit very well with, with the budgeting. Um, it would mean carving out some time, and I know everybody's time is precious, but uh, you know, our board is charged with looking at the future, not managing the current. I mean, we, we've got a township manager that does quite well at managing the, the current uh, issues and the current uh, expenses, what have you. What our board is charged with, as all of you know, is looking out for the future. And uh, I know we've tried this process a few times and haven't made it through, and I think partly because we probably bit off some very aggressive things. But I'd like to see us uh, have three or four items that we'd like to accomplish in the next six months and three or four in the next year, um, and even plan out longer than that. So I don't know if anybody has any input on it, but we're going to be we're going to be budgeting for parks and rec and what have you. And without a plan right now, Dennis uh, or Mr. Limita's uh, mission is basically uh, maintain our current level of service and to put any extra money towards unfunded liabilities. Um, other than that, that that is our charge to him. If we want to just continue with maintaining and putting extra money towards OPEB. I guess that's this board's decision, but I would like to see us uh, look forward a little bit more further than that. Any comment? So I'll just, sure. uh, yeah, so, um, you know, kind of based on what we've decided to do here in terms of uh, looking at the budget in uh, in November, um, that has to be completed by December, end of the year. We triple could try to do it a little ahead of time. Um, but uh, I guess in looking at the, the time spent here, I mean, I, I guess I'd prefer to spend time doing that. And then I don't know if we, I, I agree that we that the group ought to look at a strategic plan. I'm a big proponent of that as well, especially with the master, master plan and development here. Um, but we, I mean, I would kind of be looking at this, you know, kind of, uh, at the earliest late November, kind of December time frame. I don't know, uh, just just kind of throwing that out for the board. So we get started on the budget, and after we get started on it, we still have some time to amend it before we approve at the end of December, maybe. Yeah, right. If we, if we come out of something that we decide all of a sudden we need to redirect our funds okay. or resources. So maybe look at end of November, beginning of December yeah. kind of time frame. Yeah. Mr. Atkins, any thoughts? Not really, other than, you know, if the board decides on this uh, consulting firm to do it, maybe we can take a look at the agenda. I think that there could be a day on there that's probably not going to be beneficial to the board, but um, the, the whole team building portion of it, I think this is an effective board. And in interest of everyone's time, I think we, I think we all know really well what we're doing. I think we can jump in and you know, pick a few topics for a strategic plan. I don't think we need a big uh, coaching type of exercise. But the, the, I believe the reason why he put the uh, the first day in there was that uh, Miss Lane, I think, or actually, I think a couple of people mentioned that uh, we need to work on communication. And uh, I, I thought we had pretty good communication, but uh, I think uh, that was one of the comments made in one of the evaluations was that we need to improve our communication. So if we feel that communication is fine, then I guess maybe we can skip that. But that was a board, a couple of board members' concern. My other concern would be that there are some open items. And I think you got to you know clear the slate before you take on more. You know, I, I I'd like to see some things get closed out. Um, 
you know, we do have a few open items that Dennis, uh, that Mr. Lehman has been tasked with. I, I see the open items as fitting into the strategic plan because, uh, for example, Parks and Rec, we have a lot of open-ended things, but without a plan, they're not going to get closed. Um, and that's where we actually put the details on it. Um, I'm not aware of anything that, that Mr. Lehman is tasked with doing right now that, that wouldn't fit into a strategic plan. But uh, I think, you know, this board, I think the one thing that um, we have to do is make sure it's our plan that, uh, you know, it's, I've been on other boards where, you know, board members are, hey, you know, just, just have somebody put together one. Um, it's, it's actually the process of, of the board that says what is our priorities and what is it our vision. And uh, I'm certain that Mr. Limita could put together a plan and put all the details on the things that, that he knows his board wants done. But uh, I think we want to have, he wants to make sure it's what we want, um, not what he wants. So I think it's, I think those open-ended things, Mr. Atkins, and I agree there's a number of them, but I, I believe we can wrap them up and put a bow on them in a strategic plan, whether it's fire department, parks and rec, future the police department, tech village, all those kinds of things. So, um, anybody else have any input? Okay, um, we'll look at some dates maybe the end of November, beginning of December and bring those back to you. Okay, um, any board reports? Uh, Mr. Mansour, anything on planning? Um, no, it's it's uh, it's pretty quiet. Um, we had a presentation um, by some folks from the state. Uh, I guess I could circulate that uh, to the group here, but um, uh, nothing uh, nothing major in the Metro Alliance uh, department. And then from the Planning Commission, uh, we've begun for a few uh, two or three weeks now, uh, starting the survey process for the master plan. Uh, I know we've had at least uh, three, maybe four different um, opportunities to talk to the public, trying to get input. I've attended two of those myself. I think uh, uh, Trustee Atkins uh, has gone to one. I think there's one that I missed. But anyway, so I think that's uh, that's well underway. And uh, is it on our website? I'm not. Did we put the? It's on there, right? So we've mm -hmm. so we've got that going. So we it's a, and I expect that we were supposed to get something in the paper. I think. Uh, in the last week or so to also kind of no notify people that that survey is out there. It's on there. social media as well. Yeah. So anyway, that's uh, that's ongoing and um, we're busy now working through the different sections of it, a lot, getting a lot of the demographics and, and some of the historical uh, use um, sections put together. So we'll have that ready <coughs> when the new stuff comes in. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor Bennett. Yes. I just wanted to mention, Trustee Mansur, Supervisor Bennett got a copy of a map from like 1970 that was the future land use map from uh, Jack Kilmer from Grand Lake <laughs> Chamber. And it's sitting in my office right now. I'm going to have copies of that made because I think it will be a, it's a cool tool to use during those meetings because you show somebody what, when you look at that map from 1970 and what the future land use, mm -hmm. and you look at the heavy industrial, you'll be surprised because a lot of those are really nice neighborhoods right now. <laughs> um, but I think it really highlights the fact that why master planning and future land use is so important for the community to be involved in because when you you look at this i'll make sure you get a copy but you'll see what i'm saying when you when you show people this is why you want to be involved in this because this could have been you know a foundry right here instead of that subdivision interesting thank you mr atkins anything in parks and rec nothing to report there's only board okay mr may i see anything fire no, no to report. Mr. Guzak? Ms. Lane? We're actively into the November 5th special election and absentee ballots have gone out, a lot of them, and a lot are coming in. And Anybody who wants to vote absentee doesn't have to give an excuse. They're going to be on vacation under Proposal 18-3. You just ask for an absentee ballot and you'll get it. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be on our permanent AV list for the four elections next year, call and say you want to be on the permanent AV list so you can take time to evaluate things at home. Okay. Um, with regard to uh, a couple of items, one is that uh, we had the unveiling of the historic uh, marker um, out at uh, the Perry House that uh, 
was well attended, and I know that I want to congratulate our historic commission on on their great work and their success in getting that. Uh, it looks fabulous. You drive down Perry Road, you'll see it there. So congratulations to them. Gleaming. It's, it's gleaming. gleaming, and it, it took you know umpteen years to, to be able to get through all the uh, the tape to get it, but that makes it even sweeter, I guess, right? Um, actually, also, uh, Thorn Ridge Apartments celebrated their 40th anniversary uh, this week, and I uh, just want to praise them for uh, what a nice looking place it is. I mean, it does not look 40 years old, and it's great to have uh, you know a partner in our community that uh, really takes care of their property and um, keeps it well manicured. It's it's you know there's so many apartment complexes that we see that you know not in our township, but other parts of the state, what have you, that maybe aren't maintained, and it really can drag down a municipality. But I think it's it's great that we have a partner like that along I-75 and Fenton Road and Grand Blank. It place is enormous too, so it takes a lot of work. Um, we, there was a couple of residents here that uh, I've spoken with. They they're not here now, but uh, one of the things that I'm going to uh, and I, talk to uh, Mr. Limita and Mr. Laddie about is just repeat offenders as far as uh, ordinance violations that um, they're concerned that you know, we have individuals that are that we're continuing to send out uh, code enforcement people and uh, that there's something that escalates after a while with some of those individuals. Um, one last thing, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot Chief, but I've been hearing something about our mutual aid agreement. Is there, is there some change that uh, is going on with that or anything you could report on? Certainly. Uh, looking through the meeting packet of the city council last night, a public safety meeting uh, took place on September 30th in which Chief Smith discussed the AMA agreement and a, uh, he provided a memo to the council or to the, that group uh, regarding statistics and cost. Uh, it was mentioned there by Chairperson Blondell that they motioned to recommend that the city council withdraw from the AMA as currently written. So at this time, I have not heard anything else. And I understand from last night's meeting it was tabled uh, until a, for a future date for discussion. So that's okay. the latest update that I have. All right. So currently, our mutual aid agreement—they come out to our, all of our, our fires or calls. It, it's reciprocating. If they have a structure fire this evening, we would respond to theirs. Uh, and they respond to ours at this time. And it was okay. mentioned well before when we started putting this program together, was that we uh, we recognize the limitations mm -hmm. that the city has in being able to supply the service to us because of the volume of calls that we have for structure fires, uh, and that we would be basically removing all their fire protection from the city and we didn't want to do that. Uh, we just wanted to be able to provide this service to the schools and they wanted to reciprocate that out to the township. So the bottom line was that we we want our residents and their residents were asking for us to respond to structure fires with the school. Yes. Or any kind of call to the school. Mm -hmm. um, in order to do that they wanted to respond to all of our, our That's calls correct. for service. Right. So mm -hmm. we went along with it but it sounds like it has to be costly for them to uh, respond to all of our our calls. Are, are we utilizing them when they show up at our our fires, or have we? When necessary, yes. We've used utilized their department numerous times. Uh, the Knob Hill fire or Knob Bend fire, uh, they were used extensively there because it was a large fire. Right. Uh, we had a fire on Ruby Street, which they were called to and assisted us. Okay. Uh, Good. But many times we have the calls, and we find out later that. They're not needed. Uh, we may have a simple cooking fire that was called in as a structure fire. We arrive, we determine that we it's not necessary, so we will cancel them immediately at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So. so, but we're going out to all of theirs, right? Every fire. Or we have not had to respond to any structure fire in the city as of yet. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Lima, anything you want to report on? Uh, update the board on the um, status of contract negotiations. Uh, you know, we were negotiating with Full Time Fire. Um, the board did uh, uh, ratify that agreement. Uh, we had to work through. There were so many uh, 
changes into language. I think there was like 32 different items and working through some typos that existed from the prior contracts. Those are finally done. We're meeting at 8.30 tomorrow morning to get signatures on that. It is effective on October 1st. It didn't change the effective date um, because it had been uh, ratified by both parties. It's just that, you know, as often happens, we had to get all of the uh, uh, all of the typos and make sure that we all agreed on that language was appropriate. So uh, Clerk Lane and Supervisor Bennett will be asked to sign that at 8.30 tomorrow morning. We'll have the representatives from the full-time fire union will be here as well in the morning. As far as our police uh, units go, we uh, remain in negotiations. We took a hiatus. Um, I had requested some uh, additional scenarios be run from MERS in regards to the defined benefit pension plan. We're awaiting that information. They told us that they could get it done in 30 days and then they apparently have twice now called and said that it was going to be longer than 30 days. Uh, we did uh, successfully work through the non-economic uh, issues um, it, over a two-day period with uh, patrol and dispatch, which is the biggest unit. Uh, and I, I don't really think we have a lot of non-economics in the um, other two units. But we are ready to go as soon as we get that information back from MERS. We will be meeting, and I don't remember when it's scheduled for, October 20. Third, maybe or something is our next negotiation session. Well, we'll start uh, into the economics when we move forward. So I expect to have that back to you sometime in November. Okay, Mr. Laddie. Uh, nothing to add except I'd like you to consider an executive session to discuss a written attorney opinion. So moved, Mr. Chair. Support. Okay, Ms. Lane. Mr. Mansour. Yes. Mr. Atkins. Yes. Mr. Guzak. Yes. Mr. Massey, myself, yes. Mr. Chair. Yes. All right, we'll proceed in about five minutes in the conference room.